Well, thank you very, very much for the invitation to join you um, at, at this. Um, it's been a wonderful event. I was here last evening, got a chance to see, in fact, every single poster. I think I visited every single, um, every one of the booths. I made sure I hid my tag so um, I didn't get asked too many questions about CIHR uh, for it. Um, I thought what I might do is spend a few minutes, uh, first off, welcoming all of you. Um, it's not lost on me uh, that this is a partnership. And I, and I do get asked, uh, not infrequently, but what's my biggest surprise since coming into this role as president for CIHR? And there are a few of them. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of them. Um, but I would say that top of that list would be SPORE. Um, I think without a doubt uh, for me. And I'm going to explain to you why uh, in a moment. And part of it is to tell you a little bit about um, what I would consider to be my, my lived experience coming through this um, as an investigator, as a clinician scientist, um, and then uh, how, that, how that has changed uh, a great deal. And then I, I want to close by challenging you uh, a little bit. Um, okay, I'm going to challenge you a lot um, as you move forward with this because it's, it's something that we need to be thinking about, and I'll come back to that in a moment for it. So for those of you who don't know me, and, and the vast majority of you would not, um, I am a clinician scientist. I'm a neurologist by training. Uh, my area of research and work has been in Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, so motor neuron diseases. And I've really had two parts of my clinical hat. Uh, one of it has to really been worried and working on issues of what we call cognition um, and dementia that can occur in motor neuron diseases, a largely unheard of condition. The other hat has been very fundamental cellular biology, working at the level of molecular level of understanding the disease pathogenesis. So let me take you through a little bit of a journey there, because it's, it's one that is not uncommon in Canada, and it is one that is a challenge for you um, to, to deal with as a group. So when I first came back to Canada, it was in the 1990s, and I, I came back to London specifically because of the nature of the clinic and the research that we could do there. Um, and my patient population was purely looking at ALS individuals, so individuals with a pure motor neuron disorder. And the families were coming in and saying, our loved one's behavior has changed. Their consistency in decision-making has changed. They're more tearful. Uh, sometimes they break out in inappropriate laughter for it. And, and the teaching had been that well, what, what do you expect? Right? That's all part and parcel of a, a disastrous diagnosis, so everybody's going to handle it a little bit differently going forward with all of that. But that emotional ability component could actually be devastating. So when you talk to patients and their families, they wouldn't go out. They wouldn't go to dinner. They wouldn't go to church. They wouldn't go to social functions. They didn't want family to come over because they didn't know they might break into tears and couldn't control it. They might start laughing and couldn't control it. And we tried everything we could from a pharmacological point of view to see if we could get it to stop. And I had no success whatsoever. And then one evening, I was at a dinner at a colleague's house, uh, in fact, a neuropsychiatrist in London, and we were sitting down, and yes, at that point in time, we did have a scotch in our hands, and I said, you know, Peter, let me ask you, I have this problem that I can't solve. What do you think? And in a heartbeat, he said, well, why don't you try these two drugs in combination for it? And so we did. And I never saw the symptom complex again. It stopped it dead in the tracks. But we looked at that and went, that makes no sense. None whatsoever. Because where the drugs worked, their target receptors, were not in the region of the brain that we would have expected to see motor neuron degeneration. In fact, they were in areas in front of the motor region, completely derived differently. So it shouldn't have worked unless there was something else going on in the disease process uh, for that. And then the pennies started to drop as patients and their families would come in and say, you know, we've got to show you this. And I'll still remember one of my best patients. This, this chap who was maybe about this tall. He was a truck driver, he, and he was one of the roughest people we'd ever come in uh, for it. And, and he was the only person in 20-some-odd years, 30 years of practice, who would consistently call me Mikey. Right? I was late in the clinic, and I'd, be, I'd hear this, Mikey, where the hell are you? Well, I'm seeing somebody else. I'll be right there. No, I want to see you now. Anyways, long story short, one day he brought in poetry. And he'd started writing poetry. The last person on the face of the earth you'd think would start bringing poetry. And then other patients would come in and their families would bring art pieces. They're in my office. They're all over the walls uh, for it. And then the penny started to drop, that there was a region of the brain that was involved. And my patients were telling me this through their symptoms, their disease, through their families. Make a very long story short, there are now criteria called the strong criteria. These are international criteria by which we diagnose frontal temporal dysfunction, so frontal regions of the brain. 60% of patients get it, and if you get it, your survival in what is already a horrendous disease is one year less. 
And yet we know the basis of it now. We were able to take it to the lab to do the molecular work. We now understand I can reproduce it in animal models. I can reproduce it in cell culture. I can stop it on a dime with four different drugs or a molecular manipulation. And we're going to go back to 20 years later to the individuals who started us on that journey and said, and say, and we're ready now to go and see if we can treat it. So I've done patient oriented research throughout my career. So why is it then, less than eight months ago, when I was sitting down to a dinner with colleagues and wearing my hat as a fundamental cell biologist doing RNA work, happy to have all my grad students working away and fine molecular things, and we're sitting at dinner and an individual says to me, you know, well, who's going to be the next president of, of CIHR? And I'm kind of going, I don't know, <laughs> right? Okay, so I can lie every now and then. And then the question run around the table is, what would you do with Spore if you were president? And this table, right? And what I said was, at that time, well, if it, were, if, if it were me, I would do the same thing that I would do if I got spores into my incubators. I'd get rid of them and start all over again. That's eight months ago, right? And I wasn't facetious. And now here I am eight months later, and you're not going to find a stronger supporter of spore amongst you. So why? What changed in eight months that would take me from somebody who started off and I was doing patient oriented research, it was the core of what I was doing, and now I'm moving on to saying, and this should have been destroyed, and now I'm saying, are you kidding? So what's the difference? The difference is huge, right? And it's knowledge. And there's my challenge to you. What I now know about spore is light years beyond what I knew six months ago. I know about where it's come from. I see the interaction. I see patients becoming engaged. I see the data right, on diabetes reduction in First Nations populations right, by having teenagers teach younger children how to change their activity levels, change their diet, how to look at the metabolic risk factors coming forward with patients becoming engaged. I see the questions that are being asked now because they're appropriate to patient populations who need to have those answers in place. And I see the tools that are in place that are starting to answer those questions. And so if somebody came to me and wandered into my lab, and I had an experiment, I used this example last week, and my centrifuge is running away, right? And they go over and they unplug it. And say, so you're done. Halfway through an experiment. What do you think my response is likely to be? Or the response of my graduate students, right? Let's just say, not pleasant. So tell me again why somebody would come along and pull the plug on Spore halfway through the project, when you're just really getting rolling, when the organizations are really starting to bring the data to the table, where when you look at this, the largest grouping that you've had thus far, and I did look at every poster last night, you're asking all the right questions. So here's the challenge for you. How do you take people like me, and we're out there, there's a lot of us, generally we're called pillar one. Right? The other end of the spectrum of science research was the fundamental cellular biology, where our understanding was that this program was created at the expense of all other research that was being done. It wasn't. It was a brilliant stroke. It's a brilliant partnership. So you've got to get that message out there. You've got to get that message out there, not just to patient populations and get them more and more engaged, to our partners, right? federal, provincial, healthcare organizations, NGOs, Research Canada, you name it, go down the list, right? Have to understand what this is achieving. So every one of you in this room, I don't care what your job is on the rest of your day, you are now a spokesperson for SPORE. You have to get out there and every opportunity say, this is what's happening, this is the value add to having done this. Because it's there, it's crystal clear when I look. So you will never hear me say, I'm gonna get rid of SPORES. Spore, <laughs> okay? Right? What you're going to hear me say is, let's get ready for four to five years from now. We're going through a transition right now into Spore 2. That's going to look like something different, and it was supposed to. The design was stability in certain areas, build up other ones. So that's going to happen. You're doing fine on all of that. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is your big challenge. And your big challenge is that four years, five years from now, you need people like me, assuming they haven't gotten rid of me, right? going forward to the governments and saying, this has been so valuable to us and here's the evidence for it, right? 
The storytelling is critical, right? Make them clear, make them concise. Show us how they're actually changing the care of patients and the participation. The data on how it's changing health outcomes, because that's what we do, that's what CIHR's mandate is, right? Show us the data, make it crystal clear, make it so that anybody can look at it and go, I can see this easily. And show us the relevance to changes in healthcare outcomes, not just for a few years from now, but 20 years from now, 25 years from now. Because we all know, right, and I look around this room and I can say I've got as much gray hair as some other people in here, right? We're not getting younger as a society. Our cost is going up, our disease burden is going up, and we cannot afford this. SPORE has to help solve that. So I want, and this is self-serving, but I want in four and a half years' time, right, when we're taking this argument forward, that we are so crisp in why this is such an important strategy, not only nationally but internationally, that it's undeniable that it should grow and become bigger, not simply survive. I want to see it grow. So there's your challenge. That's the one I'm missioning to all of you. Right? Go forward, do continue doing what you're doing right now, but get it out there, make sure that everybody understands it, build it, and give those of us who need to argue for its continued existence in a greater format in a few years' time everything that we need to do that. And if you do that, I will make this covenant with you. I will be the first one at the front of that list going forward to argue on your behalf to do that. That's a guarantee. So I'm looking forward to watching this continue to grow, to continue to participate with you, right? I've learned my lesson, okay? So I thank you. And congratulations on this. I look forward to seeing more of what's happening, in particular in the next session. So thank you very much.